Good day everybody, Dr. Sanjay Sanyal, Professor Department Chair. This is going to be a demonstration of the parotid region. This is the supine cadaver, this is the right side, I'm standing on the right side and the camera person is also on the right side. What are the boundaries of the parotid region? Anteriorly, this is the masseter muscle and this structure that we see here, this is the ramus of the mandible. Posterior superiorly, we have the external artery meatus. Posteriorly, we have the mastoid process and the sternocleidomastoid muscle that we can see here. Superiorly, we have the zygomatic arch. So this is the boundary of the parotid region. The parotid fascia is called the parotidomesetric sheath. It's a very tough structure which was enclosing the parotid gland, the meseter muscle, and the sternocleidomastoid here. This parotidomesetric sheath is derived from the investing layer of deep cervical fascia, and it completely invests all these structures. It forms the stylomandibular ligament. This parotid mesenteric sheath is so tough that if there is any swelling of the parotid gland, it is intensely painful because of the stretching of the sheath. And it is supplied by these nerve fibers that we can see here. These are the fibers of the great auricular nerve, which carry pain sensation from the sheath. Now let's take a look at the parts of the parotid gland. This portion of the parotid gland that we can see here, this is the superficial part. This is flat. And this is the one which is related to these structures that I mentioned here. There is a deeper portion of the gland which is more wedge-shaped and that is here. And this deep portion of the gland is related to where my finger has gone in, that is the styloid process and the three muscles attached to the styloid process. So these are the two parts and these two parts of the gland are separated by a plane which I am going to show you a little later. Now let's take a look at these extra structures that we can see here. This is the parotid duct also called the Stenson's duct. This arises from the front of the parotid gland and it goes over the masseter muscle and then it pierces this muscle that we can see here. This is the buccinator muscle. And when I press, you can see the mouth is moving. It opens opposite the crown of the upper second molar tooth. Sometimes above the parotid duct, we can see some extra accessory parotid gland and we can see it in this cadaver. This is called socia parotidis. In this, we can also see another bit of accessory gland located here, just above this portion. So these are accessory. Additionally, this cadaver also has some extra lobules of the parotid gland located here. Now let's take a look at the structures which are passing through the parotid gland. We will go from deep to superficial. So for that, let me just reflect this parotid gland. And we can see this structure here. This is the first structure. This is the continuation of the external carotid artery. And we can see the external carotid artery is entering into the parotid gland by dividing into two major terminal divisions. This is the first one. This is the maxillary artery, which enters into the infratemporal fossa. And the smaller terminal division is this one here. This is the superficial temporal artery. So this is the continuation of the superficial temporal artery. It supplies the structures of the scalp in the temporal region. It runs in this fascia here. This is called the temporoparietal fascia or the superficial temporal fascia. It divides and supplies the frontal and the parietal parts of the scalp. This is the first structure. The next structure that we can see passing through the parotid gland is this one here. This is the retromandibular vein. Now, if you take a close look, the retromandibular vein is going inside a space here. This is referred to as the fascio-venous plane of Peti. And this is used as a surgical landmark to do dissection of the parotid gland while doing a parotidectomy without sacrificing the facial nerve. This retromandibular vein is formed by the union of the superficial temporal vein and the maxillary vein. Superficial temporal vein and a small vein is coming from the intratemporal region, that is the maxillary vein. And that is how the retromandibular vein is formed. The superficial temporal vein also runs with the superficial temporal artery. But here in this case, we can see that it is thrombosed. And my finger is tracing the thrombosed branches of the superficial temporal vein here. They also run in the temporoparietal fascia. So this is the next structure which is going through the parotid gland. This retromandibular vein then runs on top of the sternoculomastoid. And it meets with a vein from behind the ear called the posterior auricular vein. And it forms the external jugular vein which will then open into the subclavian vein near the venous angle. Other structures which go through the parotid gland are these which I had already mentioned. This is the branch of the great auricular nerve, C23, 
which supply the parotid sheath and which carry pain fibers and they also supply the skin over the parotid gland. The next structure which passes through the parotid gland is this one here. This is the auriculotemporal nerve. The auriculotemporal nerve carries secretomotor fibers to the parotid gland which came from the glossopharyngeal nerve, tympanic nerve, glissopetrosal nerve and synapse in the otic ganglion and they supply secretomotor fibers and after that the auriculotemporal nerve which is a branch of the mandibular nerve continues and supplies sensation to the skin of the temporal region. Last but definitely not the least is this structure which I have lifted up here. This is the facial nerve. The facial nerve emerges from the stylomastoid foramen between the mastoid process and the stylet process and we can see two branches of the facial nerve. One is this one here and the other is this one here which I have lifted up and it enters into the parotid gland from above down and it runs lateral to the retromandibular vein. It breaks up into a plexus here inside the parotid gland which is referred to as the pes and serenus. And from here it divides into two divisions, a temporofacial and a cervicofacial. The temporofacial gives temporal and zygomatic branches, cervicofacial gives buccal, marginal mandibular and cervical branches. And we can see some of the branches here which supplies the platysma muscle. So these are the branches of the facial nerve which go through the parotid gland. Before I conclude, let me mention some important clinical correlations. Parotid duct strictures and parotid duct stones can occur and in which case there will be swelling and pain of the parotid region. And it is diagnosed by a test known as parotid silography. We cannulate the parotid duct at its opening opposite the crown of the upper second molar tooth and inject a contrast medium. Pleomorphic adenoma of the parotid gland is also a well-known entity, in which case we may have to do a parotidectomy, either a superficial or a complete parotidectomy. We have to be careful to protect the facial nerve, which I showed a little while back. And in order to protect the facial nerve, we have to dissect in the patio-venous plane of Peti using the retromandibular vein as our landmark. Parotid surgery is the most common cause of facial nerve injury. And if the facial nerve is injured, then the muscles on the face on that side will be paralyzed. So these are some important clinical correlations pertaining to the parotid gland. Thank you very much for watching. Dr. Sanjo Sanya is signing out. Mr. Kendall Cumberbatch is the camera person. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the comment section below. Have a nice day.